And hello everybody, welcome to Unit 2, Module 6, Part 2. We're going to be discussing wounds today. So, my second here, we gotta get, get real here for a second. Um, wounds are an extremely important part of geriatric care. Now, in my experience, there are two kinds of dietitians. There are the people that are ghoulishly interested in wounds, like me, and there are the people that are horribly grossed out by wounds. Um, please be advised that there are pictures of wounds in this. I, I kind of can't show you wounds without showing you wounds. Um, I'm not doing it for the gross factor. I'm not trying to be gratuitous here. But there will be pictures of it. So, you know, I guess gird yourself. So the first thing we do need to talk about here is... Uh, couple of, wound, of terms, wound terms. Nah. So, granulation, because you will be talking about, before I explain, before we do this, let me explain why you need to know. Uh, because you will be working with wound teams if you work in geriatrics. Nutrition is a very, very important part of wound care. So you will be working with other wound care professionals. It's good to know the vocabulary for it. So granulation is new connective tissue and microscopic blood vessels. Uh, it looks like little red glossy beads. It forms on the wound bed and it, it's indicative of the beginning of the healing process. So when you get to the point where you can see granulation on, on a patient, that's a good day. That means things are turning, or turning the corner for them. All right, wound terms continued. Uh, there are two types of dead tissue. That's important because dead tissue has to be removed before healing can start. Healing can only happen off of live tissue, and it won't happen as long as there's dead tissue in the way. So over here on my right is sloth, which is wed, wed, wet dead tissue covering the wound. It's uh, usually white or yellow in color, and it's obviously wet and yucky. Uh, on my left here, or over my left, is a eschar, which is dry dead tissue. It uh, typically is black, it may be brown or gray. It looks a lot like a scab. And again, both of these have to be cleared out before any, any actual like healing can begin. Um, most wounds develop in the lower body. And you may have heard this before, your legs are your second heart. Uh, your body really does kind of depend on your legs. So there's such big muscle groups. Um, to pump, help it, help, help it, help your heart pump, you know, just by, by walking around, moving, getting up, sitting down, uh, your legs are doing some pumping action. There are four basic types of wounds. There's arterial, venous, diabetic, and pressure. So let's talk risk factors here. Um, if you cast back to, way back to literally the first, uh, the first lecture we did on assessments, um, we discussed the Braden scale. The Braden scale assesses these risk factors. So, I mean, it all comes back around, right? So, reduced risk factors, um, reduced risk factors. Risk factors include reduced mobility. Uh, this is th something people tend to think about, but right now, at this very moment, you're kind of micro twitching, you're moving around. If you work on your feet a lot, it, it, during the day, you may notice like if you shift your weight from one side to the other, especially if you have to stand in place for a long time. If you're sitting at a desk, you're leaning forward, you're tilting back, you get up and move around. All of that is to help even out pressure and avoid pressure spots. And it's not even something you think about, it's just something your body does. Um, also, the, um, the reduction or lack of sensation. Um, if you think about a time when you've you know, leaned on something too long, maybe, or I don't know, I sat somewhere too long, and you get up and like your legs hurt or your arm hurts. That pressure, that that pain is is your body saying, "Yo, move, move the arm," uh, or whatever it was. And older people and sometimes people with like neuropathy don't have that sensation any longer. They can't tell they need to move their limb, and that's why they develop a wound. Malnutrition is a risk factor. Now, I want to note here, because 
inevitably in places malnutrition will get blamed for wounds. Malnutrition does not cause wounds. Malnutrition is a complication. Malnutrition is a risk factor. It does not cause wounds itself. Comprom compromised vascular supply. Um, a lot of wounds, if you think about how malnutrition is not a wound, uh, is a risk factor. I just cannot talk how it is a risk factor. Um, compromised vascular supply, you know, the, if the nutrients aren't getting to an area of the body, that's a risk factor for wound also. Uh, compounding, compounding health conditions. If somebody is ill, they have something else going on, whether it's a, a disease or a uh, chronic condition. If the body's focus is elsewhere, if you will, or if it has multiple things it's trying to do, uh, it may just be overwhelmed and not be able to keep up with it. Now, once a wound develops, a wound takes pretty much top priority from everything else, but it can, the, all of the conditions together can overwhelm the body's ability to cope. And advanced age. Remember, uh, we have decreasing body mass, risk of dehydration, uh, uh, less ability to move. So age compounds these risk factors. So the first type of uh, wound we'll look at is the arterial ulcer. It's, um, it's caused by a uh, lack of blood flow because uh, arteries become blocked. This progressive blockage causes tissue death. Oop, sorry, wrong side. Boop, it's reversed for me. There's uh, arterial ulcer. Now, uh, if you notice that in the picture, it has a, a arterial ulcer has a neat, deep hole punch. Looks like, just like if somebody's pounded it out. Um, the area around the wound will be dry and cold, and the skin may appear cracked. They are extremely painful unless the patient has neuropathy and the pain can be alleviated by dangling the legs. Um, if you call it, because, and that makes sense, right? It's caused by blockages. Remember, arteries go out, veins go back in. So an arterial blockage means that the blood's not getting down to where it needs to go. And so when you dangle the legs, gravity's helping out. It's alleviating some of that pressure and increasing blood flow. And the second type is uh, the venous ulcer. And the venous ulcer is pretty much just the opposite of the arterial ulcer. Uh, it's caused by increased pressure buildup in the lower body because of, often because of uh, weak venous valves. It can be due to uh, poor capillary expression also. And um, it's a little bit different. Think of, if you think of patients more with edema, you often see them, they, they may develop venous ulcers. Uh, venous ulcers are shallow. They have uneven edges. A lot of them are weeping. Uh, they're associated you know, with edema. Varicose veins, and uh, they call, I will often see it called alligator skin, which is why I have it in quotes. I, I don't see it that way. To me, it looks more like a cracked, peeling kind of look to it, but uh, you know, to each their own. But look for like a cracked, thickened, peeled, bumpy kind of skin. Uh, pain can be alleviated this time by elevating the legs, which makes sense, right? Same thing. The, the issue there is that the blood can't come back up out of the legs. And so if you raise the legs and allow gravity to do some of the work, some of the pressure is relieved, the blood comes back up and less pain. Uh, diabetic, I, I mean, I put it in here because they often list it and they talk about diabetic wounds. Uh, diabetic wounds aren't caused because the person has diabetes per se. Uh, diabetic wound does come from complications from long-term uncontrolled hyperglycemia. Uh, and it is all of the things you hear about with uncontrolled hyperglycemia. Uh, poor circulation, neuropathy developing, uh, damaged immune system. Um, what happens normally is that they get injured somehow and they don't know because of the neuropathy. Um, and then it progresses to the point because they don't know, they don't seek help, and it degrades to the point where they actually, so they will notice. Um, everybody has horror stories of this kind of thing if you work in a geriatric uh, clinic or 
um, diabetic outpatient work or maybe like a renal patient clinic, you'll hear something like uh, this person was walking around and they noticed there was a blood trail on the floor behind them and then they realized that they had an injury or there was this really horrible smell and they didn't realize what the smell of what was going on until they tried to track down the smell and realized that they had gangrene in their foot. Um, it is the most common reason for non-traumatic limb amputation and it is extremely hard once you get an open diabetic wound to get it to close again. Um, the signs and symptoms of this are uh, a border that is raised and round. Uh, it's associated with cracks, blisters, and sores, uh, which really isn't a great guideline because you'll notice arterial wounds also have that. Uh, any place that doesn't get enough circulation tends to have that symptom to it. Early on, it appears red and warm, and it will then progress to eschar and eventually gangrene if it's not dealt with. And there's a lack of or very little pain, uh, and this is due to the neuropathy the patient has. Okay, uh, we're going to discuss pressure for a bit. And pressure wounds, uh, pressure ulcers, pressure injuries, decubitus ulcers, decubes, bed sores, they have a lot of names. Uh, these are localized injuries caused by prolonged exposure to pressure or pressure and shear together. Uh, these are wounds that keep people in geriatrics up at night as well. Along with sarcopenia, this is the other thing that often worries us. And the reason for this is the only reason that somebody develops a pressure ulcer is because they have gotten substandard care. Uh, if a person is in such a physical state that they can develop a pressure ulcer, they needed to have somebody looking out for them in the first place. And that means when they come into your facility with a pressure ulcer, they were in a situation where they did not get that care. It's even worse if it happens in your facility because that means your facility has not been providing good care. Um, and they are amazingly difficult to heal. As that's why they're so stressful. That's why we're spending a little bit of time on them specifically. So uh, where would you find them? Uh, areas that um, in which you really have like bony prominences in the skin that take pressure. Um, you know, like the elbow, uh, the ankle, the, I don't know why I'm pointing it like you guys don't know what an elbow is. Um, the ankle, the back of the head. I mean, for example, the knee could be, but knees don't often take a lot of pressure. So like directly to them on, on knee to the ground, so they aren't often a site for that. Uh, areas that bear weight, so often the heels or the coccyx area, and areas which receive pressure. And this is often like very light pressure that is a very thin area of the body. So the nose and the ears, it's glasses, or a nasal cannula, a toes because of sheets, and that is not a joke. I have seen this happen that somebody is in bed, they have um, the, the sheet is put on top of them and the pressure from the sheet being tucked in causes a pressure ulcer. Uh, catheters from the thigh, on the thighs and uh, on the forearms, IV. So uh, like what makes them so bad, right? Um, first of all, they can develop in less than two hours. If you also remember when I discussed uh, facilities that have what they often call R&R &R time, uh, which is rotation and rehydration, and that's literally because they can develop in two hours or less. Um, and that is when, I mean, if you recall, people will come in, make sure that the patient drinks, and if they cannot move themselves, they will be adjusted. Um, they're, as I said earlier, they're very, very hard to treat and cure. They severely negatively impact a patient's quality of life in or out of a facility, and they increase the risk of morbidity and mortality drastically. So let's talk uh, force terms a bit. Um, pressure is pressure, right? It's force exerted perpendicular to the body. So here is whoop, doo -doo, just do this way. My hand, fist, right? My fist is applying pressure to the hand. Friction is um, 
resistance generated by uh, well, it's, it's resistance generated by two objects rubbing together. In this case, one of the objects is a body, but you know, do that, you'll feel that heat burn up. That's the friction causing that. Shear is pulling the skin in different directions. Uh, think of rug burns. Have you ever had one of those evil meanie uncles that like to give you rug burns? And you know what those feel like. Um, don't go get one as a like to find out if you've never had one it's not worth it and a skin tear is exactly what it sounds like I'm not going to give you a picture of that but the skin literally rips from the pressure or the shear so uh, wounds are stayed pressure wounds I should say are, are ba stage based on severity uh, the severity is primarily determined by it says wound depth. What, what they really mean, and I, I took this directly from the uh, National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel, and there'll be more on that later. Um, it's not really by wound depth. They're showing a graphic of a hole up here, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a hole. What it is is how far, how deep does the damage go on the body? Stage one is the least severe. Stage four is the most severe. So stage one is a reddened area that is non-blanchable, which means it doesn't turn white when pressed on. And you can, you know, just test this on yourself. With with the lights in here, I don't think you'll see it on me because I am like sour cream. If you press on an area, it turns white, and then it turns red, and then it turns back to normal, right? That's pressure is pushing the blood out of the area. When you release it, then the blood will rush back. It, it turns white. Then it turns red as the blood rushes back in, and then as everything evens out, it turns back to its normal skin tone. Uh, with a pre stage one, cell damage, cell structure damage has happened such that it cannot spring back. Uh, stage two is can, can be a bit tricky. Stage two is when the epidermis has been damaged and the dermis is exposed. So this means any kind of excoriation in the skin where the you have you know it's scratched down to the dermis. Or if you have a sore that has rib, has rubbed open to the dermis, or if you have a blister, uh, if you have a blister that's raised up, that qualifies as a stage two because the dermis has been breached. Uh, I'm sorry, the epidermis has been breached. The dermis is exposed, even if it's covered by a bubble. Excuse me. Okay, stage three, we hit what are what are called full depth injuries. This means that the term full depth means that they've completely penetrated the dermis. In a stage three, muscle and or fat tissue is exposed to the open air. And uh, stage four, it means the wound is open to the bone. Uh, I remember being in a group that was doing wound training for nurses and the trainer said, if you have a probe and you tap on the wound and it goes tink, 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 that's a stage four. And that, that's always stuck with me. Uh, this means, uh, stage four means that really deep tissue damage has been done. Muscles are damaged, tendons are damaged, ligaments are damaged, and bone can even be damaged at this stage. We also have some other ones here that don't really, like, they get their own category, so they don't really, they don't really fit in anything else. Um, a suspected deep tissue injury is a closed pressure ulcer of unknown depth or severity. And it's not... How it says it is not like nobody knows what's going on precisely we know there's a pressure injury there we just can't tell how far deep it's gone how far the damage has gone because it's closed still so remember it's not just that um i know stage two is a, a, a breached epidermis into the dermis but remember farther down it's not a stage three or four is not how deep is the hole because there may not be a hole as i said it is how far has the damage gone? So we, deep tissue injuries are treated like stage three to four due to the uncertainty of the injury itself. Uh, unstageable full thickness are kind of the same thing. In this case, what happens is that there is, a, I, I really hate sounding gross about this, there is a plug of dead tissue that's keeping the wound team from being able to assess the wound. There was a time when that would be removed, just automatically. Take it out to find out what's going on. Um, that thinking has changed because it's, as long as the plug is there, the, the body is healing naturally, 
And so more often now, the plan is to let it stay there. So we don't know how deep it is. Again, these are treated as deep tissue injuries. We just keep the area clean and protected. And we'll go into MNT on these a little bit because that is important. Oh, I'm sorry, I have technical difficulties. There we go. Uh, final one is mucosal membrane injury. Uh, these can't be staged. This was this is uh, this is a newer one. Um, these came out recently within the last couple of years as as a, its own type, because it was pointed out that um, there are areas in the body that you know don't go from epidermis to dermis to muscle to bone, and what do we call those? So these are mucosal membrane injuries. These can't be staged. Because again, they don't follow the normal, typical pattern of striations of tissue. They're typically caused from pressure from medical devices, things like uh, NG tubes, catheters, cannula sometimes, uh, ventilation hoses, anything like that. Where, like, again, there's, there's nothing there. It's just, you know, if you think like the NG tube, it's just going down through the esophagus. And through the nasal cavities, there's no bone there or anything to really, for it to rub against or to measure it against. So treatment, what do we do about these? I, I, I promise that they were really hard to fix. Uh, there's no gold standard. Um, <laughs> as bad as this sounds. So the, what, what treating a, a pressure wound entails uh, consists of a combination of trying to support the body while it's healing itself and getting out of the way as much as possible combined with a bit of throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks not every wound heals the same way so um what do we do when i say we're, we're supporting the body what do we do we uh manage any comorbidities as best we can if someone is ill we address that if um we make sure that like say they're getting good they're getting dialysis uh, we're controlling blood sugar as best we can things like that um, the antibiotics they get those so the body doesn't have to and fight off an infection while it's trying to heal um, increased mobility we want to make sure we're that patients are being moved uh, if we can get them up and moving themselves that's fantastic uh, also that we're taking pressure off of the wound itself Occasionally, debridement may occur. That's not that common anymore. As I said, it's much more common. Um, if, if it's a closed wound, it's much more common to leave that alone. If it's an open wound with um, dead tissue around it, that may be debrided. Nutritional support. We'll get there in a minute, but yes, this is a thing where we are super crucial. Uh, nutrition support is key. Now remember... Um, Listen, nutrition support, malnutrition cannot cause a wound, but nutrition support can absolutely increase the odds of healing a wound. Uh, wound vax to, if, if a wound is actively producing pus or sloth, it may be sucked out through a wound vac and negative pressure to try to oxidate the, uh, the fresh living tissue. So, that yeah, did my best to cover this here. Uh, there are some alternative, uh, kind of strange sounding therapies. Maggots, uh, they're sterilized maggots. It's sterilized both in the sense that they can't make babies and in the sense that sterilized for surgery. Uh, I, I've been, I've seen maggot therapy done. Uh, literally, they have the open wound, they dump in the maggots, they put some meta honey on it, put a cup on it, bandage it up. 72 hours later, they come back and irrigate out all the dead maggots. Maggots only eat dead tissue, and it's a very efficient way to get it cleaned. Um, I talked to the guy that was having it done, and I was like, what does this feel like? And he said, that I don't really feel anything, honestly. Um, another thing that's used sometimes is sterilized leeches. Um, the leeches are really good because they have enzymes in their saliva that encourage, that thin out the blood and encourages uh, innervation and infiltration of blood into areas that aren't getting it. Because remember... All of these wounds, except pressure wounds, are caused because the blood's not getting to where it needs to be. So the, so the leeches are very good at encouraging blood flow through those areas. Okay, now all of these run on MNT. All of this MNT comes from the 
2019 Quick Reference Guide uh, for the National Pressure Injury Advisory Panel. That's the most recent one they have. They, it's kind of like some of the other ones. They, they up, release a new update every few years. So one thing to keep in mind is that, one, uh, the body will always prior, prioritize a wound over everything else. And two, wounds are catabolic and energy intensive as heck. So the MNT recommendations are 30 to 35 calories per kilogram of current body weight. I do take some issue with this um, because we have people, if they have some, someone who's very obese, this can be astronomically absurdly high. And I don't think it's realistic all the time. Uh, sometimes I will do an MSJ calculation with a very, very high um, stress factor added to it. Now, uh, for protein, for a partial thickness, so a stage one or two, they recommend one to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. For a full thickness injury, they recommend one and a half to two. And fluids, I mean, it says 30 to 35, but they're essentially recommending one milliliter per calorie. So it's so also some micronutrients. Uh, remember that vitamin C is essential for collagen production. At a partial thickness, the recommendations are 100 to 200 milligrams per day. Uh, at full thickness, they recommend 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a day. And you can give, remember, you can't overdose on vitamin C unless you really, really like, try um, most of it. If, you, if the body doesn't need it, they'll just flush it out. Um, as one person told me, vitamin C is cheap, wound therapies are not. Let's give them the vitamin C and see what happens. Um, the Academy Wiffle Waffles on this, they are currently at the point of, yeah, let's give them the vitamin C. They go back and forth between give them vitamin C. Vitamin C hasn't been shown to do anything back and forth. I said, right now we're at give them vitamin C. Let's see where it goes. Uh, vitamin E, if you recall, recharges C. So vitamin C is the active antioxidant. Vitamin E gives an electron to the vitamin C to recharge it so it can do its job again. Uh, there's not a recommended dose for vitamin E. And if you also recall, it's not very hard to get vitamin E in the diet. So it really may not be necessary to supplement vitamin E at all. Uh, vitamin A is not one we talked about. It's not one that comes up for geriatrics unless we're in a situation like this. Uh, it stimulates epithelialization and uh, helps mediate the immune system response. The recommendation is 10,000 to 50,000 international units a day for up to 14 days. And zinc, remember zinc is also important to collagen uh, synthesis. It's also uh, plays a role in RNA and DNA synthesis, so creating more tissue. Uh, the recommendation there is 220 milligrams a day for up to 14 days. Now it's important to note, it's not 14 days and then never again. It's 14 days, stop, take some time, see where they are. If the wound's not progressing, then start another round. And then finally, the last two things to talk about here are arginine and glutamine. Um, you may recall from the undergrad work, arginine and glutamine are, uh, can they can be considered conditionally essential. And, and this is a case where they're conditionally essential at times. Um, because the body uses up so much of it that you're just, the patient is not able to take in enough to balance out what, they, what they're using. Uh, so arginine stimulates insulin secretion and it promotes transport of other amino acids. And glutamine can function as a fuel source for fibroblasts and epithelial cells. So it's just another energy source for them. Again, it's like a shotgun blast. They just hit it with everything they've got because wounds are so catabolic. So guys, that was wounds. Congratulations on surviving wounds. That's the most grisly stuff I'm going to show you. I promise. Um, so remember here on the outro, there are four types of wounds. It's arterial, venous, diabetic, and pressure. Wounds are not caused by malnutrition. Do not let a wound nurse tell you that. Um, it's a risk. It's a, it can be a risk, but it's not a cause. There is no gold standard for wounded treatment or care. It's literally just try a thing. That didn't work. Try a thing. That didn't work. Try a thing. Hey, we got somewhere. Let's keep doing this. 
Uh, and remember that wounds are incredibly catabolic and a huge risk to patients. That was wounds. Guys, I'll see you for comorbidities three. Have a good one.